14, Isaiah chapter 14. I appreciate uh, having the DeFord family, Pastor DeFord and his family with us today. He's always been a blessing to me and an encouragement, and I'm grateful for uh, uh, pastor friends in the ministry. Isaiah chapter 14. I love the children in our church, and one of my favorite kids is uh, Losi and Anna's little girl, Chloe. And I had a funny story from VBS this year about Chloe. And uh, we, because of just, they want to have her to be healthy and all that, she's only allowed to have dark chocolate. She can't have uh, certain types of candy and stuff. Well, she had won a prize and uh, had, had come up here to get a prize. And one of the boys, uh, knowing this, said, you know, uh, uh, boy, they're looking and said, we don't, we don't have any dark chocolate. All we've got is this Hershey's milk chocolate. And little Chloe does this number. Presumably looking for her parents. Looks around. Hershey's will be fine, she said. <laughs> I wonder how many times in our life we do that, right? We're presented with something we probably shouldn't do. and We just, yeah, Hershey's will be fine. Point being... No matter how cute we are, we're all sinners. It's what demands a message like the message today. There are some instances when a pastor takes to the pulpit with a certain amount of dread, and this is one of those times, because I like positive, uplifting, encouraging messages, and the last thing a pastor wants to do or a preacher wants to do is make people uncomfortable who are listening to his message, but at the same time, uh, I have a God-given responsibility to bring the whole counsel of God to you. And that means when we preach the Bible, we preach the Bible whether it's the good parts or whether it's the bad parts. Or, uh, you know, we talk about the love of God, but we also talk about the judgment of God. And so we talk about the Bible as it is. Thomas Jefferson took on himself uh, to alter the Gospels. And he actually quite literally took a sharp knife and cut out certain parts of what he did not like and during the Gospels. He considered himself a man of science, and so he did not believe in miracles. And so obviously the feeding of the 5,000 is not scientifically possible, and so he cut that part out. And uh, now what, we, what, what he ended up with is what we know as the Jefferson Bible. You can still buy a copy of the Jefferson Bible on Amazon today for $31 or thereabouts. Uh, but you have a pastor in front of you today who believes that this book is sacred from cover to cover. Everything within it is meant for us, and we ought to take uh, literally. I believe in the inerrancy of the Word of God. I believe it is perfect. 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All Scripture is given, for the in, is in, given by inspiration of God and is profitable for reproof, for doctrine, for correction, or for instruction in righteousness. We do not have the luxury to take a pair of scissors to what we don't like in the Bible. Uh, but, we, but, but we do that, kind of. Uh, we read certain parts, and, and uh, how many of you, like me, love Proverbs and Psalms? Psalms is encouraging, and Proverbs has the nuggets of wisdom. I love quotes, as you know, as, and if you've heard me preach any amount of time, I like quotes and little, I've been collecting them for more than 20 years. I've got this uh, whole file where I, I have different topics and different quotes that I've heard, and, and I like collecting those, and I like the book of Proverbs. Uh, and then there's other parts of the Bible we tend to ignore a little more, and, and we don't spend as much time in there. Now, whether or not we use an actual sharp knife to cut it out, we have to be careful that we don't pick and choose what to believe and what to live by in the Word of God. All Scripture is given by inspiration. So today I want to deal with an immensely unpopular subject. Most preachers avoid it entirely. I'm talking today about the subject of hell. The devil does not want us talking about this. Uh, this is the time usually when we have the most distractions in the audience, and so I ask you to bear with me today as we go through, keep your phones off and those type of things. In fact, the devil does everything he can to turn this into just a big joke. Uh, Ted Turner, uh, who you might know, is the founder of TNT and TBS and CNN. Uh, he mocked this idea of hell at the National Press Club a few years ago. He said these, this, and I quote, Remember, heaven is going to be perfect, and I don't really want to be there. Those of us that go to hell, which will be most of us in this room, most journalists are certainly going there, and there was laughter throughout. But when we get there, we'll have a chance to make things better, because hell is supposed to be a mess, and heaven is perfect. 
Who wants to go to a place that's perfect? Boring, and again, laughter throughout the room. Jesus died on the cross, but Mr. Turner said he shouldn't have bothered. He said this, and I quote, I don't want anybody dying for me. I've had a few drinks, I've had a few girlfriends. If that's going to put me in hell, so be it. One of the ways that people in our society deal with this idea is just to mock it and to make light of it and to act like it's not a big deal at all, like it's a joke. But I want to read a passage to you. We'll get to this part of the passage in a little bit, but I want to read it now. Isaiah 14, and uh, oh, let's see, we're going to start in uh, verse 12. How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. Yet thou shalt be brought down to hell, to the sides of the pit. They that see thee shall narrowly look upon thee and consider thee, saying, Is this the man that made the earth to tremble, that did shake kingdoms? Father, I ask you today to use this time. You know my heart. You know my heart is not to hurt anybody, to offend anybody, or to uh, make uh, to, to be overly dramatic. But Father, I do believe the Scripture is clear, and I pray that you'd help us to see what the Bible has to say about this subject of hell today. May you use it and challenge our hearts, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Recently, I read an article entitled, The Emotional Toll of Hell. And one of the things they talked about is that belief in heaven is consistent with higher life happiness and uh, life satisfaction. And belief in hell is associated with lower happiness and a lower satisfaction in life. People that believe in hell, it goes on to say, tend to have a lower self-esteem. In fact, a survey was done a few years ago, and they surveyed people in a thousand churches, much like ours, and they found that less than 50%, that's less than half of the people in the church, believed in the reality of hell. Now, most people, and one of the most common beliefs is in some kind of afterlife. Most people believe there is uh, some sort of afterlife. And and uh, by the way, you ask most people well, the, where they're going to go when they die, and most people will answer that they think they're going to heaven. Uh, but while heaven is everyone's preference, this is not the truth. And that brings us up to this very avoided subject, which is the alternative to heaven, and that is hell. There is this, and by the way, this is not a hellfire damnation type of sermon that where we get up and roar and try to be all kinds of dramatic. I've heard those, and you probably have too. I want today to speak to the mind and the heart, and both to the Christian here and also to those that might be without Christ, have never accepted Christ uh, for their personal Savior. And I want to answer three questions this morning. What is hell? Who is go who goes to hell? And then why? Why does it exist in the first place? And that's what I want to preach on this morning. Why hell? The, this, the thought of hell bothers me, really, it probably bothers you as it does most people. It goes beyond our human comprehension that people would burn forever and ever with no end in sight. It is incredibly difficult for a lost person to reconcile the fact that we preach a loving God and a merciful God with a God that would throw someone into eternal hell. And that's why there's a much higher percentage of people today who believe in heaven than those that believe in the existence of hell. Though that is an incredibly foolish hope, that you might have one without the other. That's never made quite sense to me. Uh, But I remember the first time in my life when it became a reality. I was about 11 years old, and we, we had a lot of books in our home. We didn't watch much television, and so... Uh, we had a lot of books, and one of the books I had was uh, Ripley's Believe It or Not. Remember that uh, years ago, and I would read through that, and I'd read all about all these amazing things. And one of the factoids that he had in there, he did a write-up about heaven with the measurements uh, that the Bible gives. And, of course, I wasn't putting more faith in him than the Bible, but it was intriguing to me because he did the measurements, and he said, now, if we uh, look at the number of people who have lived and the number of people that can fit into heaven... The last person that could fit into heaven was born in the mid-1800s. 
I was born in the mid-1900s, the latter 1900s, okay? Uh, and so that made me not a candidate. And so I'm thinking, wow, that's interesting. I remember I took it to my dad. He was studying for Sunday sermon or something. I said, Dad, look look what it says. He's talking about how no heaven's full. It filled up like 100 years ago. And Dad just said off the cuff without thinking much. He said, yeah, well, he's assuming everybody is going there. And that's when it hit me. That's when it became real. Not everybody is going there. In fact, most are not going there. More will go to the alternative than will go to heaven. And many times I've tried to close my eyes and imagine a horror that hell is. Now, I don't consider myself an intellectual giant, unless I'm talking to Corey, and then it seems like I am. But <laughs> You were real close, I'm sorry. I don't hold myself to be a moron either. I'm about normal, I would think, in intelligence. This is not a case of religious brainwashing that I am a victim to, uh, as the world might have you believe. In fact, the reason that I believe in hell as a real place is because it is all throughout this book. And this book has been proven to be true uh, over and over and over and continues to be proven true, and I believe it from cover to cover. The punishment of the wicked in hell is as never-ending as the bliss for the righteous in heaven. Jesus himself verified this in Matthew 25, 46, uh, and these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous unto life eternal. In fact, Jesus spoke more about hell than anyone else in the Bible or any biblical writer wrote about the subject. One half, or, I'm sorry, one uh, half of his parables and 13% of the New Testament alone warn of hell. Uh, he, there are over 162 references in the New Testament that uh, warn about hell. Over 70 of these references were uttered by the Lord Jesus Christ himself. As Christians, we're constantly asked to prove what we believe or, or we're questioned about the things that we talk about out of the Bible. Many times with logic, there's a so-called theologians that talk about these scriptures on hell to be open to alternative interpretation, but it is not true. If hell is not a true and real place, then what in that book is true? What can we trust at all in it if that can be discounted? Because if one thing is false, then what can we put our finger on anything and call it to be true. The Bible is true from cover to cover. An old Puritan pre preacher preached these words years ago, There is no way to describe hell. Nothing on earth can compare to it. No living person has any real idea of it. No man in delirium ever pictured a place so utterly terrible as this. Uh, no nightmare racing across a fevered mind ever produced a terror to match even the mildest hell. Let the most gifted writer exhaust his skill in describing the roaring caverns of unending flame, and he would not even come close to the nearest edge of hell. Hell was originally created for the devil and his demons, not for man. Little wonder there is great joy in heaven when one sinner uh, repents. He is saved, he is redeemed, he is rescued. It makes the heart of heaven glad. No wonder Jesus talked about it. No wonder he mentioned it so often. I want to ask these three questions. We begin with, what is hell? What is it? Well, hell is fire. Matthew 25, 41, Then shall he say to them on his left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed, into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Revelation 20, 15, And whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Matthew 9, 44, And then two verses later in verse 46, And then two verses later in verse 48, all the same verse says, where their worm dieth not, where the fire is not quenched. Let's look at what Jesus said about hell. Now, I'm going very fast here. If you want a list of this later, I can give it to you. He called it fire in Matthew 7, 19, in chapter 13, verse 40, chapter 25, verse 41. He called it everlasting fire in Mark 18, 8, and 25, 41. He called it eternal damnation in Mark 3, 29. He called it hell fire in Matthew 20, 5, 22, and 18, 9, and Mark 9, 47. He called it damnation in Matthew 23, 14. He called it damnation of hell in Matthew uh, 23, 
33. He called it resurrection of damnation in John 5, 29. He called it a furnace of fire in Matthew 13, 42 and verse 50. He called it the fire that shall never be quenched in Matthew 9, 43 and verse 45. He called it the fire that is not quenched in Mark 9, 44 and 46 and 48. He said, where their worm dieth not in the same three verses. He said there would be wailing and gnashing of teeth in Matthew 13, 42, and 50. He said there would be weeping and gnashing of teeth in Matthew 8, 12, and 22, 13, and 25, 30. He said there was torments in Luke 16, 23. And he said there was torment in the flame in 16, 24. He said it was a place of torment in verse 28, a place of outer darkness in Matthew 8, 12, and 22, 13, and everlasting punishment in Matthew 25, 46. If hell is not real, then Jesus Christ was the most deceived man in the New Testament because he talked about it all the time. From cover to cover in this book, it is very clear there is no relief from this place called hell. That's why in Mark 8.36, Jesus said, For what doth it profit a man if he gain the whole world and lose his own soul? We understand the world is not worthy to trade for your soul. The world cannot buy you out of hell. The whole world does not make hell worth it. When you share this truth with people, though, and I have, and maybe you have as well, you get a statement like, I thought Jesus was all about love. And God is love, and God is mercy. And yes, He absolutely is. That's why He did everything He possibly could to make sure that nobody would have to go there. When I prepare a message like this subject, it is not, trust, trust me, it is not without a lot of prayer and a lot of forethought. It's hard to preach on this subject. That's why most preachers won't do it. But i got to be honest, and it, it's something I do not enjoy but here, Paul is preaching in Acts chapter 20, and he says something very interesting in verse 26 and 27. Wherefore, I take you to record this day that I am pure from the blood of all men, for I have not shunned to declare the whole counsel of God. And it is the duty of every preacher to preach this book and this in, the entirety of this book. And if the word of God is 13% about hell itself, then we got to talk about it. Amen? And it is a, a pastor or a preacher who will not talk about it, I believe is derelict in his duty. Jesus talked about hell all the time. And he loves people. By the way, that's why he spread his arms willingly and died a sinner, uh, a criminal's death. And he did it for you and he did it for me to pay the cost of our sin. Why? So we have a way of escape from this place called hell. We say we love people. Yet we do not tell about this way of escape? Is that then real love? I, I've heard it said about preachers that preach on a subject like this. Man, that was harsh of him to do something like that. Well, is it more love not to warn people about a place like that? Not at all. Jesus is love. That's why he talked about it. So what is hell? Hell is fire. Secondly, who goes to hell? Hell is a real place. They that go there suffer torment we cannot imagine. But this torment is self-inflicted. It is a choice that they have made. God is not willing that anyone go there. He is not willing, the Bible says, that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. He has done all that He can to make sure that no one has to go there. But He gives us a solemn warning in Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. He says this, Not every man that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Not everyone, he says, that claims they're going to heaven is going. Not everyone who thinks they're going to heaven is going. In fact, the Bible says straight is the gate and narrow is the way which lead to life and few there be that find it. The majority of people today and really in history, the majority of people in the world's population sadly do not go to heaven. But they don't have to go to hell. Heaven has been made, uh, heaven, there has been made a way of escape by the Lord Jesus Christ. So who goes? The unrepentant sinner goes to hell. Luke 13, 3, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. The one who goes through life refusing to turn from their sin and turn to Christ, that person, the Bible says, goes to hell. Uh, the sinner who refuses to place his or her trust in Christ, 
uh, John 3, 36, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life, and he that believeth not on the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. The sinner that refuses to put his trust in Christ alone for his salvation, that person, the Bible says, goes to hell. The proud sinner... Uh, Mark 10, 15, Verily I say unto you, Whosoever shall not receive the kingdom of God as a little child, he shall not enter therein. So there comes a time in our life where we have to humble ourselves. We have to realize our inability to do it on our own. And we have to kneel before a mighty God and put our trust in Christ. That's what a child does. A child totally trusts. I, you've had... Uh, those of you that have children know this. It's it, we, we have to teach them, right? Uh, do not get into a van, even if they're offering candy. And you you can you, to ask the child back, what do you do if somebody offers you candy and tells you to come into their van? Oh, I go. I like candy. No, no, no. We have to teach them. Don't trust. Don't trust. We have to teach them about stranger danger because their natural inclination is to trust. That's what a child. That's why Jesus mentions that uh, as a child. And then the one who rejects God's only way. And this is where it gets a little more painful for us. Jesus said in John chapter 14, verse 6, I am the way. I am the truth. I am the life. No man, no man cometh to the Father but through me. We must humble ourselves. And we have to understand, God does not desire anyone to go to hell but in His holiness, it demands a payment for our sin. Now, either I will attempt to pay for it myself, and I'll do so in vain, because there's nothing I can do to save myself. I tried, uh, I was raised in a religion, a very strong religion that uh, did, we did all, we had more rules than you could shake a stick at uh, to try to make ourselves righteous. And in the end, we can't make ourselves righteous because sin is not a behavioral issue. If it were a behavioral issue, then you could, ch then you could solve the problem by changing your behavior. But sin is not a behavioral issue. It is a condition, just like cancer is a condition. You can't better your health if you have cancer by being good. You can't give away all your money to charity and now my cancer will be gone. No, no. Cancer is a condition. It's not a behavioral problem. Good people get it. Bad people get it. Sin, our sin is not a behavioral problem. It's a condition that we can do nothing about. Uh, we can't change our behavior and expect to take care of our sin problem. And this, this includes those who put their trust in baby baptism or put their trust in church membership or put their trust in the good works that they do. Hey, the Bible says Jesus Christ, He is the only way, the only door. It is through Him. Not what I can do. The doctrine of eternal punishment for those who reject Christ is all throughout the Bible. But despite that, people don't want to believe in hell. And unbelief does not change the truth. Have you ever noticed that? You understand that. You've talked to people who believe different things. It doesn't change the truth. Did you know right now, in 2023, one-third of Irish people believe leprechauns exist? One third, every, one out of three Irish people think leprechauns exist. All right, that doesn't make them real. Doesn't change the truth, assuming there's no leprechauns. I'm just going with that assumption. I don't know. Maybe they're right. But if there is none, that doesn't change anything just because we believe it. You can say, I don't believe in gravity. Jump off a building and it's not going to change what's going to happen, okay? Belief or unbelief doesn't change the truth. By the way, no one understands better than someone in hell that God is just. We read the story of the rich man and Lazarus in Luke 16, and both died, and the rich man went to hell while Lazarus went to paradise. And it's interesting that the rich man never asked, hey, how did I end up here? This is a little extreme. This is over the top. This is unfair. Never says that. But uh, he does uh, ask if somebody can't go and warn his brothers that they don't come to a place like this. He recognized the fairness that he had earned it that he had sinned. So we see uh, what it is and who goes. Why? Why does it exist? Why hell? When I was five years old, my dad uh, took us to a, an estate sale. 
And uh, we went to this sale, and while we were there, it turned out they just had had a litter of puppies, and he bought me a puppy. Uh, he was, uh, uh, so, uh, and I ended up having this dog till I was 16 years old. So his name was Tippy. It was my dog all growing up. Um, we called him Tippy because, uh, as you'll hear in the story in just a little bit, he lost one of his legs, and so when he ran, he tipped. And that's what you do. You find a disability about somebody, and that's what they label him as. So that's what we did. We weren't very sensitive. We called him Tippy because he ran weird, okay? And uh, so that was my dog all through growing up. But soon after we got him, we took him home, and our neighbor had was having a problem with a varmint uh, uh, taking some of his chickens or something, and so he set a trap, one of those traps that... Uh, leg traps, and uh, and um, our dog wandered around and got his foot into that trap. He got caught, and uh, the trap was set for a varmint, but Tippy, when his paw was in the wrong place, he got caught in the trap. Now, in the Bible, first God created angels. We don't know exactly when. We do know that the angels were created before the earth, according to Job chapter 38, and Satan fell along with his minions, at some, some time before uh, he tempted Adam and Eve in the garden in Genesis chapter 3. So Satan's fall occurred somewhere between the time the angels were created and the time that he tempted Adam and Eve. We don't know exactly when that happened, but we read about it in Isaiah 14. The Bible says that he created the angels to be ministering servants, according to Hebrews chapter 1. And in our text in Isaiah 14, this is one of the two passages in the Bible that they attribute to Satan's fall from heaven, the other being found in Ezekiel 28. Uh, these two passages are referring specifically to the kings of Tyre and Babylon, but the reference is the spiritual power behind these kings, which was Satan. And these passages describe why Satan fell. They don't tell us exactly when it happened, but it tells us why. In fact, in Luke 10, 18, Jesus talks about he remembered that day. He said, I beheld Satan as lightning falling from heaven. And so God created angels. Then God made a place of suffering. It is a place of consciousness. It is a place of memory. And it is a, an eternal place of suffering. But I tell you what it is not. It was not made for man. It was made for the devil and his angels. And so God made that place for the angels that sinned. In Matthew 25, 41, when he says, Depart from me, uh, ye cursed into everlasting fire, he says, Prepared for the devil and his angels. In fact, in Isaiah 5, uh, we read about the biggest remodeling project that's ever taken place. In verse 14, it tells us that hell enlarged itself. It had to, because more than its original planned occupants were now going to occupy it. They were fully warned in Isaiah 14, 15, uh, I'm not going to go into the whole history of, of Lucifer as uh, Satan, but he had been created as a masterpiece. He was revealed the uniqueness of God's creative powers. He was a jewel in this family of angels. But pride started to take place in his life. He started to see his beauty and his ability as his gift to God instead of God's gift to him. He deceived a great company of angels, and together they rebelled against a supreme sovereign God. Can you imagine that? The created rebelling against the Creator. Happens all the time in our society, though. They were cast out of heaven. They were left without a permanent dwelling place. The entire company of Satan and his fallen angels have been vagabonds from that day. Now, God clearly warned them. He set the trap. And many of these angels sinned. And again, why did Lucifer think he could defeat God is a mystery to me. It's hard to imagine that he would think he could do battle with his creator and much less defeat him. But uh, he was filled with pride. And like it does for Satan, pride uh, confuses us as to our own abilities. It confuses us to who we are. And uh, we are often very blinded by that very thing of pride. Now, God had no choice in the matter. He already made a price for sin. Uh, if his word is no good, God is not God. God's word is always good. And then God made man. And Satan wanted to drag man down to the hell where he was going. He was in the Garden of Eden where Adam and Eve were. Then this low-down snake uh, tempts man with the same sin that took him down from his throne. He filled man with pride. He told Eve that 
uh, the, the, the same lie that he had fallen for. He said, you shall be like gods if you eat of that fruit. Now he fills man with pride to think I can eat what I want to eat. I'll do what I want to do and go where I want to go. And he still uses that lie today. The way of Satan, by the way, is to go your own way and do your own thing. That's his will for your life. Just do whatever you want to do. Just don't do what he wants you to do. And so man became caught in the trap that was made for the devil and his angels. The reason of Satan's fall is he wanted to be like God. Genesis 3, 5, he tells the same thing to Eve to tempt her. For God doth know that in the day you eat thereof, then shall your eyes be opened. You shall be as gods, knowing good and evil. He's tempting them with the same temptation he fell for. Now, again, the price had already been set. God had no choice in the matter. If his word is not true, then he is not God. And he is God, and he is ultimately truth and honor. So for Lucifer and the other angels to rebel, despite all they knew about God, was a horrible, it was the utmost of evil. And now man has sinned in the Garden of Eden. Let's get back to my little dog, Tippy. The trap was set for a varmint. Now he caught the varmint later. But on this day, he caught my puppy, Tippy. And we didn't see him for three or four days. Uh, we thought he was gone. We didn't know that this all happened until later. Uh, but he, he was gone. You know how dogs are, especially farm dogs, would go off to heel somewhere, and he came back. You know, he left with four legs. He came back with three. So we knew something had happened. But he, this trap was not set for him. But first it caught Tippy. Now, was he trying to catch Tippy? No. That was not his aim. It was not his goal. But when Tippy got caught in the trap, and again, we found this out later. Then he took him out, he wrapped the leg, he dealt with it as much as he could, and he let him go so he could go back home to our place. He didn't, wouldn't have cared if it was a varmint, if it was a varmint and knocked it in the head or shot it, because that's what he was trying to catch. But when Tippy got caught in the trap, he made a way of escape for him, because it wasn't for him, it was for the varmint. You see the difference. And so, praise God when he saw our condition... Because he is just, punishment must be served because he is a just God. Without God's judgment, you are missing a big part of the gospel because without wrath, there can be no grace. But God said, I'll make a plan. And he looked down across the ages and he realized the sin of all mankind. He saw your sin and he saw mine and he realized there is nothing we can do about that sin. It is a condition, not a behavioral issue. And so he said, I will make a way. He sent his only begotten beloved son. First John, or, or I'm sorry, John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. He sent his only son to earth to die in our place so he could save us from this terrible, terrible place. Now Satan does not have dominion over us anymore. In 1 John 4.4, 4, he says, Ye are of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. This is how the earlier problem that I mentioned is rectified. Now, when I'm met with the question, how can a loving God throw someone in hell? I welcome that question now, because a loving God doesn't throw anybody into hell. A loving God did everything he could so you don't have to go to a place like that. And if you choose to go, you got to get past him because he has made it free. What more can he do to make it free? Romans 6, 23, for the wages of sin is death, but the gift, the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Let me close with my original question. Do you believe in hell? Do you really believe in hell? It doesn't agree, like I said, with my sense of personal justice. If I were handing out sentences, and hell was my option, I mean, I, here's a murderer, like 50 years of burning, I think that's enough. But I'm not handing out those sentences. Burning forever and ever, it seems a little extreme. But I, And I submit to you this morning that, and I'm including myself in this, that we really probably don't, really fully believe in it. Now, we believe here, we read in the Bible, we, oh yeah, I, I know it's true, that's what the Bible says. But do we really believe it here? Do we really accept the fact that this could be our loved ones? This could be our unsaved neighbors and our friends? Let me illustrate this uh, a little bit with a, another story. In 2010, 
we were still living in Michigan. It was a couple years before we came here, and, and we were living in Michigan. And we had a we had this big house in Michigan, and there was a like a a mud room, and then attached to the mud room was a big garage. And the the person who had built the garage built it for a thirty foot motor home, so it was a big garage. And outside the garage, we had a fire pit, too close to the home, granted, but is a fire pit that was out there, and we used it a lot. I burned wood in the house. We always had a ton of wood. And, and uh, one night we're burnt. It was in the fall about this time of the year where we burned our uh, head of fire in the fire pit and sat around out there and, and fellowshiped as a family. And then when it was bedtime, the coals were all burned down, and, and uh, so we went into the house and went to bed. I didn't realize that the... The, there had been a lot of leaves had fallen and there were leaves all around and, and these, uh, these uh, coals were catching on the leaves and they were slowly working their way toward the house and against the house was a big uh, tier of wood. Well, it made it all the way. And about 2 o'clock in the morning, my neighbor, thankfully, had to answer the call of nature and he got out of his bed and he's walking toward uh, the bathroom when he looks out the window and he sees flames are just shooting up our garage on the outside of our garage. And I mean, it's a, by this time, it's a roaring fire. We're all the way on the other side of the house, which means it would have been a really bad situation before we'd have ever realized it. Now, he rushed out the door, barefoot in his jammies, runs over to my house, and he starts pounding on the door and yelling at the top of his lungs. He did not care if he bothered me. He did not care if he inconvenienced me. He did not care if I might be offended that he woke me up. He saw a big problem, and he did everything that he could uh, to run over there and wake us up. He did not say, well, they're sleeping. They're comfortable. I hate to bother them at this time of the night. I'll tell them at a more convenient time. No, no. He's banging and he's yelling like a fool trying to get us out of bed. And I'm glad he did, friends. He, he got hero status in our family because he very well saved at least some of our lives. He saw a potential that we might be in danger and he did something about it. And as a child of God, we know what the eternal future holds for those that face life without Christ. And see, I don't think I'm talking to people today that don't care. I don't think we're talking to somebody that's that callous. And I certainly feel I'm not that callous. I care about people. And so I firmly believe that it's really a lack of acceptance on our part that really at our core, do we believe that our neighbors, that our friends, that our loved ones will spend eternity in a place like this? It was on an American troop ship during World War II that a new chaplain came on board. The rank and file of the soldiers were gathered to meet him, and, and one of them asked him this question, Do you believe in hell? Well, the chaplain was a modernist, and he was enlightened, and he chuckled a little bit and says, Man, I certainly do not believe in hell. And this is what they answered him. Sir, we would like for you to resign as captain of this troop ship. Because if there is no hell, we don't require your services. But if there is a hell, we're not going to be deceived by the likes of you. Those soldiers were right. If there is no hell, there's no need for you to be faithful to church. There's no need for you to read your Bible and to witness to people around you. There's no need to be concerned about your soul's eternity. But if there is a hell, then we better ask ourselves, am I prepared to avoid it? Have I done what's necessary not to go there? How can I escape what Jesus said was that warm that never dieth and the fire which is never quenched? And if you are saved, what are you doing about your loved ones, about those around you? Is there someone that you work with every day, uh, maybe have for years, that you've never told about the gospel truth and the gospel story? When's the last time you begged God for someone's soul that isn't saved, that you love? We can do this exercise, and I don't like to do it. It's convicting, but if you breathe in and breathe out, five people just died. 180 people die every minute. Since I've been talking this morning, 5,000 people have slipped into eternity. One day it will be you. One day it will be me. I don't know when that is. None of us do. But that's going to happen to every one of us because the Bible says, as it is appointed unto man once to die, and after this the judgment. 
A man was looking for a place in New York City to party late one night. And he asked a police officer, I'm looking for a nightclub called Hell's Gate. Can you direct me to it? The officer said, sir, just keep going down that street. And when you pass Calvary's chapel on the left, just keep going past Calvary and you'll get to Hell's Gate. You got to go th past a lot of things to get to Hell's Gate. You have to get past the love of God. You have to get past the resurrection, the Word of God. You have to get past the church. You have to get past the conviction of the Holy Spirit. And most of all, you got to get past the cross. Don't get past Calvary without settling your eternity. As I was preparing this, I was thinking, because again, I've told you many times before, I'm, a, uh, I'm very practical in my thinking. I like pictures, word pictures, and putting myself in the story. And I was thinking, what if we just could turn this church into a big old elevator and shoot ourselves into hell just for 10 seconds. Just 10 seconds. We would be, it would be a long 10 seconds. What if we could experience it all for 10 seconds? I think it would change our perceptions of life, of sin, of evil, and of priorities. I think it would change everything. I think it might just motivate us to share the good news of the gospel with as many as we could. I think it would make us want to tell everyone about Christ's redeeming work on the cross. We probably wouldn't be too concerned with offending someone. We probably would not be, or we would be willing to have an uncomfortable conversation. We would never be without a gospel tract. We'd be handing these out like to everyone we meet. Uh, we'd be wanting to work the gospel into conversations. We would make an effort. And I'm just pleading with you today Let's be faithful in making an impact for the Lord Jesus Christ. Aren't you glad if you're a child of God today that He made a way of escape from this terrible place? And we need to share that gospel message with those around us. Let me ask you this question. Who is in heaven today or on their way to heaven right now because you told them? Can you think of anybody like that? Maybe it's a ch child, a grandchild, or a friend. I hope you can think of someone, and if not, why don't you get busy and we do something about it? And we give gospel tracts out, and we be a witness to those around us, and we share the gospel message. God chose us. He put on His children the ministry of reconciliation. We are the ones that are responsible to get the gospel out to the masses. Let's be about our business. Amen? Let's have every head bowed, every eye closed. Not a pleasant subject to discuss. But I believe it's an important one. I believe that with all my heart. You're in here today, friend. No one's looking around. Nobody's going to embarrass you. I'm not going to point you out. I just want to pray for you. You're in here today and you say, Pastor, I'm not quite sure. I don't know if something happened to me right now. I don't know if I'd avoid this place called hell. I don't know for sure if I'd be in heaven. I hope so. I might even be 90%, but I'm not 100% sure I'd be in heaven. Would you slip up your hand and let me pray for you? I'm just not quite sure. Thank you so much. What about you, dear Christian? Who have you told lately how to escape the wrath to come? Jesus Christ talked about it all the time. How sad it is when his followers never mention it. Let's be faithful. Would you stand along with me as she begins to play if the Lord spoke to your heart this morning? Maybe, maybe you put somebody on your heart this morning that you need to tell. Maybe you put a face in your mind 